broadcasting from the Unshackled Studios in Melbourne. This is Wilms Front, brought to you by the Unshackled.net. Now here's Tim Wilms. Uh, you would have heard yesterday about uh, Network 10. Uh, they are going through their second round of uh, cutbacks, uh, which include uh, axing, in my opinion, probably their uh, biggest network star, Carrie Ann uh, Kenley. Uh, she, she, of course, uh, is, was known during those hot topic uh, se segments on, on Studio 10 uh, for all well, saying what... Uh, e e most people uh, do think, uh, but don't often say when it came to uh, indigenous welfare and uh, Extinction Rebellion. The coronavirus pandemic has, has fast-tracked a lot of uh, major cutbacks and redundancies at mainstream media outlets. Uh, this is despite their desperation to gain clicks and eyeballs with scary and sensationalized coronavirus uh, lockdown news. Uh, this hasn't stopped their uh, revenue uh, collapsing. Uh, so Network 10, uh, back in May, they axed their 10 daily news site uh, with these latest cutbacks. Not only is it uh, Studio 10 affected, uh, but all of their news bulletins are going to be broadcast uh, from Sydney and Melbourne. So those that you see in Brisbane, Adelaide and Perth, they'll all be coming out of uh, Sydney and Melbourne. So to help uh, us analyse the mainstream media retractions in 2020 is Graham Young, editor of Online Opinion and director of of the Brisbane-based Australian Institute for Progress. He was a featured guest uh, back on Wilms Front in May to discuss the Queensland political landscape with their pending October 31st state election. I caught up to chat with Graham about the Network 10 uh, cutbacks and the, the general mainstream media reductions. Graham, welcome back to the show. Great to be with you again, Tim. Uh, now, we thought uh, after the, the, the first wave of the, the coronavirus that uh, mainstream media, they, they'd done all the, the, the cutbacks uh, that uh, they could justify. But uh, Network 10 yesterday, uh, they announced uh, further uh, redundancies, including uh, their big names at uh, Studio 10, Carrie ann Kenley, Natasha Belling and, and Tim Bailey. Uh, the, the project remained uh, unscathed, which I know myself and a lot of others were uh, quite uh, upset about. Network 10, it's always been the, the number three commercial network. It's, it's always had the, the aim of of being number one in the uh, 16 to 39 uh, demographics. And it is a commercial TV network, so it still does have that free-to-air uh, terrestrial reach. But this, uh, this also follows the closure of their 10 daily uh, news and lifestyle website on, on May 22. So what is happening at, at 10? Well, you mentioned COVID. I don't think it's really got that much to do with COVID. I think there's a few businesses around using COVID as an excuse to uh, revamp and change and try and make things more profitable. Uh, but you know, basically for the last 20 or so years, we've had a, a slow rolling avalanche, uh, which is uh, being the migration of advertising from uh, broadcast medium uh, to uh, more targeted medium, media. Uh, so, you know, Organisations like Google have hoovered up uh, most of the advertising budget, or certainly, yeah, I'd say most of the advertising budget, uh, and they now feed it up to people over any platform. Uh, and they feed it up to people on the basis of what people are likely to be interested in, uh, which is an annoying thing that they're not really that good at guessing whether you're interested. Sometimes they'll know that you've looked at a website which offers a particular sort of product, and then they'll follow you around, pestering you because they think you might be interested in buying that. And they don't know if you've actually bought and satisfied that need or not, but it's still a more efficient way of getting to people than uh, putting something on TV where it's a bit haphazard as to who's watching it and whether they uh, retain it. And where you've got to spend huge budgets repeating the same message over and over again to get to people. So television, um, has depended on those advertising, I mean, entirely on those advertising dollars to keep going. And 
they've been migrating away now for, for 20 years. And the uh, upshot of that is that um, TV stations have had to pare back. Uh, they've had to work out how to produce content uh, at little cost. And that means that they've been skewing much more towards entertainment uh, than they were previously. And uh, uh, the news components have been uh, gradually being uh, uh, either eliminated or turned in, into entertainment themselves. And now we heard recently Federal Treasurer uh, Josh Frydenberg uh, announced that uh, the the ACCC was go uh, was at first going to see oversee a, a voluntary uh, mediation between the the tech giants uh, uh, Google and Facebook and the uh, mainstream commercial media outlets uh, uh, about uh, getting a a fee for uh, for the content being posted on their platforms and uh, i know that this is this has been a, a gripe of the of, of the mainstream media organizations for a while it, what is do you, do you think that this is uh, just that uh, because what it is basically is when links are, are shared on on facebook that's that's what they want they, they basically want to cut of Facebook users uh, sharing sharing their links in groups or wherever. Um, yeah, well, you won't read about it in the mainstream media because, you know, what I was saying before about that avalanche of uh, advertising leaving them and going to Google uh, means that they're they're struggling for revenue. Uh, it's no, it'd be like uh, them charging the news agent for putting up a display advertising their product. You know, when you look at, at how the, the media um, organises their, their websites, they spend a lot of time trying to do what's called search engine optimization. Um, they want those search engines to send people to them. And the way that the search engines send people to them is that they have snippets um, from the uh, mine, from the, uh, the newspaper, which presents their articles in a way and the the newspapers and the, the broadcasters, etc., the news or media organisations, um, they participate in this. They set up their, their content so it will display uh, on the search engines with nice images and so on, be attractive, and hopefully people will click through. Um, so you can't expect an organisation to do that for nothing. And Facebook and, uh, and Google sell their own ad advertisements, etc. Um, and, and that's how they make an earning from it, but they provide that platform. They can't, um, they can't uh, produce their own material. So they're using material which is effectively gifted to them by the news organisations on the basis, and the, the quid pro quo is, we'll then send the traffic back to you. That's what a search engine does. Um, the, the real problem here is that 20 years ago, newspapers and other media organisations decided they'd give their material away for nothing on the web. If they were charging for it, they wouldn't have this issue. But they're not charging for it. Uh, they haven't had enough confidence in the product that it has sufficient value. And, and possibly it, it doesn't have sufficient value for people to want to pay for it. Well, that's a basic problem for the content provider and they shouldn't be going for the effectively commission agent, which is, is what the, uh, the search engines are and saying, well, we've made a mistake, um, so you've got to give us some of your commission. You know, it shouldn't work like that at all. And I'm quite disgusted, I think, is the word with the federal government for effectively being complicit in trying to solve what's a commercial problem for the, uh, the media organisations and to solve it um, by penalising uh, the, the search engines and, and the, the social media. If we turn back the clock 30 years ago, that was uh, still the golden age of uh, television, radio and, and newspapers because all the classifieds went into the, the papers that was described as the, the, the rivers of gold and of course uh, the, the major uh, brands, if they wanted to get their name out there, uh, they, have, uh, they advertised on, on television and radio and, and a few uh, print advertisements as well so it's it's been huge uh, disruption there but also well newspapers at least uh, they charged for 
buying the newspaper. They're Back then, there was oh, it might have been less than a dollar uh, for a copy of the, uh, the, the the Herald Sun or the Daily Telegraph or the Age Sydney Morning Herald. Obviously, the the prices of the daily newspaper, particularly the broadsheets, have have gone up again. But people still paid for them, whether by the day or through a subscription. Uh, but we're certainly seeing, as you said, they 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 made the mistake of giving it away online for free. Uh, but there, there's now also this uh, sense of entitlement from the consumer that it, it, most of them are not going to pay for uh, for news. Uh, for example, going back to links shared on Facebook, if there's a, a, a if there's a, a link to a paywalled story, people just be like, I'm not going to pay for it, or they'll try to get a workaround from it. Uh, so there's a complete shift in there. There seems to be still a firm uh, resistance from the consumer that they shouldn't have to pay for or what they see as clickbait stories it's they, they they don't see that it's worth it's worth paying for well and that's a problem for the news organizations which means they've got to find ways of uh, providing higher quality um, material uh, there are things that people will pay money for um, there's two sorts of things. One is pornography, believe it or not, because even though there's a lot around you can get free, they still manage to make money out of selling subscriptions to porn sites. And the other is financial tips, tip sheets. Um, so there's a number of organisations out there that um, um, Motley Fools, one of them, for example, uh, which make money out of publishing uh, subscription uh, financial advice services. Um, uh, Alan Kohler, for example, um, he got into that business and he sold his first business to News Corp uh, for, I think, $12 million. Some, some, or it might have been $20 million and he got 12 out of it, something like that, but quite a substantial amount of money. Uh, the Wall Street Journal is a paywalled um, publication. It's been paywalled, I think, from the very beginning, um, and it manages to make money. I'm quite happy to pay for my subscription to the Fin Review, the Australian, and I kind of get the Courier Mail in there. You're in Queensland, you, you've sort of got to uh, pay attention to your local uh, state. Uh, and I think you'll find there'll be a lot of people like me, uh, or in, an increasing number of people, I should probably say, who will grudgingly stump up money uh, for some of the higher quality publications. But, you know, other organisations like Fairtrack seem to me to be going down the clickbait route. And I think, you know, they should suffer the consequences because that is not valuable material and people will not pay you for it. Uh, and uh, therefore, you're going to go broke. Uh, and, you know, Channel 10 is more in the discretionary uh, end of um, broadcasting. You know, it's, it's not a broadcaster that most of us would notice if they weren't there. You know, I, I don't watch the stuff that appeals to the older age bracket and uh, I've watched the project a few times and uh, um, there's, uh, there's definitely a knowledge deficit there uh, at the very least. Though we do see this paywall paradox in that people are now prepared to uh, pay for on-demand ad-free streaming services such as Netflix, Stan and, and now Disney Plus where uh, g uh, going to traditional uh, television uh, that was always free and you could if you wanted something on demand you could uh, ta uh, tape it off the the tv in a in a vhs but it's interesting there's been that that shift like my own ex my, uh, in my own life i'm prepared to play for netflix and and stan and 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 disney plus for the for the on-demand content uh, they're they're both media products news and streaming services yet there's a lot more willingness to pay for the streaming services yeah well i think most of us are um, probably paying for uh, streaming services now anyway because increasingly television is delivered via the internet uh, you can still get it free to air but um, i'm not sure as in using the old um, uh, analog um, bunny system, ears uh, yeah, bunny ears, but I think, you know, most people now are getting it through through the uh, uh, NBN, etc. Uh, and it generally comes bundled with some sort of a uh, subscription service that does your internet and 
gives you access to Foxtel, Netflix, etc. Uh, so, you know, I think that's where the media organisations are going. Um, and organisations like um, Channel 10 uh, are kind of outside that at the moment. I'm a bit vague, actually, on the overall ownership. Um, a Viacom CBS Viacom, is the overall yeah, yeah. owner uh, of Network Yeah, Channel. that's right. So, so they're probably hooked into that. But, but in terms of domestic um, uh, market, Channel 10 isn't really. Um, so that's a problem for them. Um, so, we, you know, we're, we're moving to a different sort of media organisation. And that's a good thing. You know, we, we didn't always have these large uh, broadsheet newspapers with the classified advertising. That's something that developed over a few, probably 100 years. I mean, the, the original newspapers were much more like blog sites. Uh, the original news organisation uh, was, um, um, uh, oh, what was the name of it? Um, anyway, it, they, they made their money by sending agents to watch what ships were leaving. Reuters, Reuters was the first serious news organisation and it made its money by sending agents overseas, monitoring what ships were going out of port and what cargoes they had transferring that financial, that valuable financial information back to merchants in England faster than anyone else was, and people could make real money out of it. Um, so, you know, that's where the serious news started. Reuters, as we know, morphed into this uh, very large media organisation selling syndicated content effectively now, but that's not where it started and that's not where it's going to end. And we shouldn't, we shouldn't expect things to stay uh, stationary and static. And I guess getting back to the federal government, that's one of the bad things that they're doing here, that they're, in, they're discouraging innovation. Um, you mentioned COVID. If we're going to come out of COVID well, um, I think we, we have to build an economy that is more innovative than the previous one was, not less innovative. And yet here you've got the federal government trying to prop up uh, legacy news proprietors um, by swiping money off one of the true innovators. I've got problems with Google, you know, they, uh, they, they, and Facebook. Uh, they play ducks and drakes with advertising, not with advertising, but with the searches to a certain extent when it comes to politics. Uh, there's a different, definite skew there, um, but they shouldn't be being penalised uh, because they've got a more successful model than, than the legacy operators. We should be setting up a situation where the legacy operators are encouraged themselves to be more innovative. You know, if, if Fairfax had uh, set up realestate.com.au, which they could have, um, they'd be prospering. But they didn't. They thought everyone will have to come and, and, and read our newspapers anyway. And if we, go, if we go in this direction, it'll cannibalise our existing business model and we'll lose money. It won't be as large as we are now. Well, they're not as large as they were now then. But realestate.com.au, it's diversifying all over the globe. And it may well end up being larger than the original uh, body that it, that it effectively cannibalised. So, you know, there's lessons there for all of us uh, that you can't afford to stand still. You've got to have a product that people want to buy and you've got to have confidence they want to buy it. Uh, and governments shouldn't be there uh, trying to, to hold back the new entrance in favour of the old entrance. It's not the way forward and it's not the way out of COVID. Uh, we haven't mentioned the the, the magazine uh, closures yet. Uh, Bow Media, which I think seven and nine, which used to own a lot of Australia's uh, uh, most prestigious magazines, they correctly offloaded uh, those assets. Uh, but Bow Media have uh, closed eight titles, and I'm surprised that it took them this long to to close those, given that if if newspapers are finding it they're hard for people to buy, then those glossy magazines which are, uh, are printed on well, in colour and, and, and also on uh, thick paper. Uh, but uh, what probably uh, most concerns people about uh, uh, printing uh, closures is the, the, the regional uh, paper closures. Uh, there was a News Corp, uh, they, they announced that they were closing 112 uh, of their, their regional titles from printing, 76 were going to online 
only. And so there's this concern about the disappearing local news. And then there was also at the end of last year, uh, Seven Network cut their regional uh, Today Tonight bulletins in, in Perth and Adelaide. And given, I, as you know, I'm from Melbourne, uh, there's been a, a lot of commentary that uh, the local Melbourne media here is now too weak and that's why Daniel Andrews has uh, escaped scrutiny for so long up until now. Uh, we, we still have radio seems to be doing well. 3AW uh, has uh, been quite uh, uh, critical and scrutinizing Andrews. But what do you say to that argument that the, the closure of these regional news outlets that allows uh, state governments and also local governments to escape scrutiny until there's a major crisis? Um, well, that's been going on for quite a long time now. Um, and look, I, I, I mourn the, the passing of the, uh, the television current affairs programs more than anything else. Um, what they had uh, was the ability to put politicians under pressure so you could actually see them reacting to a, a proposition uh, the print media doesn't really do that and, and never really has. Uh, the way the print media um, operates is um, via research, inside stories, scoops, that sort of thing, um, blowing it up on the, the front page. Um, but uh, they've got to manufacture the, uh, the news, whereas uh, broadcast media, which is live, where you're interviewing a politician, um, they can often manufacture the news themselves by the way they answer a question or what they say. Um, and it's immediate. You know, you, you don't have to spend days or weeks trying to ferret something out. You can actually put a politician on the spot and get a response. Um, and I think that, yeah, there's some truth uh, that um, the governments aren't being held to account because of the lack of that. But Look, you know, I remember the days of Joe Bielke Peterson up here in Queensland and uh, the National Party had a, a headlock on government uh, for uh, 27 years, I think it was. Um, 32 uh, years total, 22, National yeah, Party. 1957, yeah, through to, geez, uh, you're better at it than I am and um, I lived through it. Um, so, you know, we had all those paraphernalia at, back in that time. Jay used to refer um, to um, interviews as feeding the chooks. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I don't know there was any more accountability, even though there was more news. So I don't quite buy that. Um, but, um, you know, I, I think news has got a news, as in News Corp, has got a problem in those regional areas if it thinks that it's going to uh, make a living off um, internet only publications that are free to read. Uh, they'll only manage to do it if um, they're subscription services. So uh, uh, I know up here in Queensland, the, uh, there's a number of local newspapers that are actually kind of part of the, the Courier Mail these days. So you read the Courier and you'll have something from Redlands, which will be co-branded with the local portal, which it effectively is down there, not a, a newspaper. And uh, the same thing up uh, Caboolture, for example. Um, so... Um, yeah, if they can't charge people for that, that'll be a problem. Um, but look, we're in a new world where we don't print so much stuff out. So people are reading online um, and they are getting their news. You know, maybe they're getting it less formally now than they were. Uh, and that, that is a problem for management uh, because misinformation and partial information um, get passed around. Um, but I think at the end of the day, holding politicians to account, that's really done by other politicians. And, um, you know, I think our politicians have got a long way to go on being smart about how they run their online media. And I think there's probably room there for kind of in-house media that the political parties themselves um, should be doing a lot more and spending a lot more time effectively building media organisations that can then get shared around on um, Facebook and, and uh, Instagram and uh, all those other social media platforms. Um, so there's a need there. We'll work out how to meet the need. We haven't worked out how to do that particularly well at the moment, but I think we're getting there. You know, I think you have to have faith uh, in human progress. 
uh, we've come a long way. We've come a long way from the original shit sheets, if you like, of Grub Street um, uh, in the early days of um, publishing, uh, when you know the term grub um, was coined basically because all the, the newspapers came out of Grub Street and there was the grubbiness of the, the, the media. Well, in a sense, nothing much has changed. Um, we've innovated, we've changed over a couple of hundred years to where we are now. In a uh, hundred years time, you're kidding yourself if you think the media is going to look like what it does now. But you're also kidding yourself if you think that it won't bear some sort of family resemblance to it. Well, you're absolutely right uh, in the, in, in with the point uh, with uh, the current uh, COVID uh, catastrophes, both at the state and federal level, that uh, the uh, the political class uh, the, uh, themselves uh, aren't doing the best job at holding each other to account. But that's a whole other topic which we might get into a, into a future show. Uh, you're around about two and a half months now from the Queensland uh, state election, uh, which uh, that'll be oh, one of the the, the, the first border uh, elections. Uh, but uh, we might check check in with you again uh, later in the campaign trail to, to, to get more, more of an update on that. Okay, that'd be great, Tim. Look forward to it. Uh, might have some polling for you by then too. Okay, excellent. Because yeah, can't can't get enough polling, even though they might be wrong. We just love them. Well, I do qualitative polling, so it's it's never wrong. It just doesn't predict election results, but it tells you what people are thinking, and that's really the the most important, interesting thing about election analysis. Um, and you know, it's something I've been doing for twenty years. It's uh, kind of data journalism. Uh, it's a sophisticated form of the uh, vox pop, if you like, but a lot of journalism. Uh, isn't worth buying because really all that happens is journalists talk to other journalists, they live in a bubble, they recycle what they all think, uh, and the public looks at it and they don't recognise it. Uh, so what I started doing 20 years ago was building up a panel of people in the community, some of whom I agree with, but most of whom I don't, uh, who fill in questionnaires for me and they tell me in their own words what they're thinking. I distill that out. And that gives me a much better view of what's going on than I think you'll find in uh, most media um, outlets. Like an insider's panel. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, well, an insider. It's a complete waste of time. You're talking to people who only talk to people who are trying to generally manipulate them. They're, they're the real insiders, the people internally in the political parties who feed out morsels of information, generally only partial morsels of information. They get these people on a string. They then go on new so-called news programs and they then retail uh, what the, the wholesalers and the political organisations have given them. Um, and it's, it's not news. It's, um, it's propaganda, basically. Well, it's what's termed the political media uh, industrial complex. Uh, if people want to see your, your better, more raw uh, work, they can go to your website, uh, onlineopinion.com. Has it got the AU at the end? .com.au, yeah. Yep. .com.au. And also uh, your research at aop.asn. Dot au and also uh, you write uh, for the the, the spectator.com.au which does have a, a a paywall i'm not sure if you have any inside knowledge about how well that's working um well they pay me a little bit so it must be working a bit at least yeah oh well then i'd say that yeah it does does seem to be working then <laughs> but um you know i think um journalism Something that, that, that um, came out of the um, migration of the rivers of, uh, of gold, as you put it, was that a lot of the serious journalism, even back in the heyday, was actually a product of philanthropy. And the philanthropy was from the advertising department, which was making all the money, to the news department, which was spending it. Mm. Um, so I think the spectator um, probably has a bit of philanthropy uh, behind it, uh, just as the Australian uh, uh, has had with and uh, also the Saturday department. paper and the Guardian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so there is a there is a, a long-standing model there where a lot of news organisations haven't actually made uh, enough money to pay all the bills, but someone has stepped in who said, "No, this is worth doing." Um, and um, you know. I I see Gina Reinhardt advertising a lot on Sky News and think, 
maybe she's uh, uh, fulfilling that role uh, with Sky to a certain extent because I'm not sure that Gina really needs to advertise to the public uh, to make her business run. All right, take care, Graham. Thanks again for, for joining the show. Always a pleasure, Tim. See you. Thanks for tuning in to Wilmsfront. Visit timwilms.com or Rational Rise TV to view the archive of episodes. And keep visiting theunshackled.net to view all our shows and to keep up with the latest real news and analysis.